Welcome everyone and thanks for joining us on today's panel discussion webinar, Driving Compliance Decisions by Using Data Repositories Effectively, brought to you by the ITGRC Forum. I'm Kelly Vick, the host of the program, and it's my pleasure to welcome today's speakers. Our moderator is Colin Whitaker. Colin is the founder and director of Informed Risk Decisions and has over 30 years experience in cybersecurity, and he currently provides cybersecurity risk consultancy services to a wide range of public and private companies. Colin has presented on information security at major events around the world and has published a number of papers on security. And on the panel, welcome Jason Dover, Chief Product Officer of FileCloud. Rebecca Harold, CEO and founder of the Privacy Professor Consultancy and Privacy and Security Brainiacs SaaS Services. And Dirk Schrader, Global VP of Security Research and Field CISO at Netrix. We'll get into introductions in a moment, but first, a short housekeeping video. We'll be right back after this. The ITGRC Forum, educational content for governance, risk management, and compliance professionals. A forum for thought leaders to address today's GRC and IT security topics. Taking that threat intelligence and using that as an overlay in your existing systems becomes really important. There is a big difference in service providers versus other third parties that you might be providing data to. But it highlights organizations' lack of preparedness for situations like this. Here are some housekeeping notes to be aware of. This webcast is interactive and we want your questions. Please submit these at any time using the questions tab and we'll address as many of these as possible during the webinar. We've also lined up some polls to get your input and we'll notify you when these are active. Please be ready to submit your response when prompted by using the box below your console. Just make sure the slides are not in full screen mode or you will not see the options. Make sure you check out our supporting resources in the Attachments tab, as we've uploaded some great content for you today. We want to hear from you, so don't forget to leave your feedback and comments. We take feedback seriously, and it helps us plan for future programs. This webinar is approved by NASBA. To qualify for CPE credit, you must demonstrate participation by attending the full session, responding to the polls, and by rating us at the end. Certificates will be issued within seven days from our learning management system, the ITCPE Academy. So please watch out for the email notification and check your spam folder if that doesn't come through. After the live presentation, this webcast will be available on demand. So please share with any colleagues who you think will be interested in the topic. And now let's get started. Okay, so on today's webinar, we will address how to centralize and standardize data across your organization for improved data quality and integrity. Strategies for enhancing data security and ensuring compliance with industry regulators. The role of data repositories in reducing redundancy and promoting data reusability. And best practices for implementing data repositories that scale with your organization's needs. Moving on to the agenda. We'll begin with speaker introductions before running over some quick tips recommended by our panel. And then we'll dive into the Q&A discussion facilitated by Colin before closing with takeaways and further information at the end. So now without further ado, over to you, Colin. Thank you very much, Lee Kelly, and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the session. Uh, as Kelly mentioned, to start with, I'm going to run around the table and hear each from uh, hear from each of our panelists. I I'm going to invite them to tell us a little about themselves and the organisations they're working for. So this will help provide some context to the conversation we're going to have this afternoon, so you know where everyone's coming from uh, in the discussion. Uh, I'm going to start with yourself, Dirk. Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, can I ask you to tell the audience about yourself and the work you're doing there in Netrix? Uh, well, and on, on top of what's written on the on this slide here, um, and as you can probably see from my my beard and, and uh, being sort of outdated picture in in that, um, um, being the VP of Security Research, which is my my primary role in Netrix, is to sort of combine what we do with our products and see how they work along with the processes and the 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 obstacles our customers face uh the other half of that is to um do sort of generic research topical research with the uh sectors 
like healthcare, like uh, production environments, and see how um, typical applications, uh, let's say uh, uh, radiology in, in healthcare, for example, um, how they fare in terms of cybersecurity. How is that evolving over time? How is, are the reaction times? That's basically sort of the the overall thing. And we're talking if we're talking about networks, um, as you can see here, we're trying to address um, in, 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 a, in a different way of phrasing it, like not only talking about data identity infrastructure as our idea of how the attack surfaces can be structured. We're talking about uh, things like in, in, in columns of governance, operations and monitoring and control. Um, where our solutions are designed to be end-to-end -to, -end to, to plug the gaps, as this slide is telling here, uh, so that we can, in, in, in the end, create connections between uh, what we see is existing and what are the consequences of what is there in terms of risk or opportunity in, in, in improvement of cyber in, in cybersecurity. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Dirk. All very relevant what we're going to discuss this afternoon. So thank you for joining us. Uh, right, we'll move on to, to Rebecca. Rebecca, welcome back. Lovely to speak to you again. Uh, tell us a little bit yourself and your role as the Privacy Professor. Yes, thank you so much, Colin. And good afternoon, everyone. I've worked in the IT space for over 35 years. I started as a systems engineer, went into IT audit, and then throughout the 1990s, I built the very first information security and privacy program at a Fortune 200 financial and health insurance corporation. I've owned my own business since 2004, and I've taught master's degree courses and created curriculum for the Norwich University's MSISA program. I and my business teams have specialized in security, privacy, and compliance throughout all these years, and have looked at many different types of cybersecurity and privacy risks and associated mitigating controls, including for centralized repositories. And now to my business, my privacy professor business provides a wide range of consulting and privacy and security brainiacs, um, types of online education and awareness materials and other governance products. Currently we're focused deeply into healthcare, emerging tech, and the other areas shown here. We're gathering experts with deep experience and knowledge in specific topics and upcoming courses to add to those created by our current master expert, Dr. Kabe, and his secure coding course. And all of our courses support CPE credits. And we also provide products like security and privacy policies and procedures uh, and templates. And we love working with MSPs, consultancies, and law firms to provide products to their clients as well. So thank you very much. Thank you very much to you, Rebecca. Um, finally, we move on to Jason. Tell us about yourself and the work you're doing there at uh, FileCloud, Jason. Sure. So I started my career in enterprise IT, primarily in the uh, finance industry about 17 years ago or so. Uh, mostly systems administration and engineering uh, on solutions like SharePoint, Microsoft Exchange, Active Directory, and, and similar things. Uh, worked on a lot of integration projects and such over the over the years. Uh, eventually came over to the technology vendor uh, side of the house. The, the driver really was, I, I realized I had a lot of empathy actually being a user of technology. And I wanted to take that to make better products. And that, that's how I got into the uh, the vendor side of the house uh, worked across a number of product and marketing positions here at filecloud i lead uh, product and strategy uh, the focus of what we do is enterprise file sharing and sync uh, essentially this is making it easy for people to access their enterprise data as well as to share and collaborate on it and it, it's interesting because uh, security versus collaboration and sharing can almost be contradictory uh, the focus of our solution is finding that right balance uh, allowing people to do that in a governed and managed way uh, so that the CIO is not uh, bumping his or her head uh, all the time dealing with all of the uh, shadow IT that might be happening uh, otherwise. And that's what we help customers do. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Lee, Jason. Uh, and thank you, all of you. That's really good introductions. And I think it helps the audience understand we've got some really good talent on the panel this afternoon to discuss this issue. Um, one of the things we always invite our panelists to do is to 
uh, get the thoughts going uh, from the audience is to come up with what we call some quick tips. And these tips are just really designed to give you some ideas um, of what you need to think about. For, the first one's all about uh, uh, being realistic about the role and scope of unified depositories, you, recognizing that they're good, but they may not be the silver bullet. Uh, understanding how one complies with legal requirements because the risks are significant, and understanding how one can classify content uh, and data ingress to simplify management as the repository grows. So I'm going to bring each of the panelists in and each of the uh, to answer some of the um, points about some of these. I'm going to start with yourself, um, Dirk. Uh, I certainly welcome your note of caution in your tip about not being a silver bullet. C can you explain on why we need to be cautious? Well, the, uh, the the one thing that is a reason to be cautious about is that um, even using a, a unified data re repository doesn't sort of free you of your your to monitor data creation, to monitor and, and classify what is going on. So if, if you see that here, the reduce the need for direct access to production system, that's a, a positive side of using unified data repositories you can do that you can reduce the need for that nevertheless you still have that um data creation data generation uh, aspect reducing the sprawl of that, that that's the, the the part where udrs might not that's that as i mentioned not be the silver bullet to to really say okay i can reduce the the creation of regulated data or sensitive data where its sensitivity is not only driven by by regulation but it's also driven by how important is the data for yourself for your business and um and going to the final point if we're talking about something that is outside of centralized systems um data that is sort of created on the endpoints it still requires governance you still have to have a handle on that um therefore coming back to the point of of, of being a of, of not being a silver bullet data repositories can help you to um streamline your your um your approach to to uh compliance to data governance but it will certainly not re relieve you from doing that brilliant thanks very much Dirk. Uh, i'm sure we'll come on that point very um uh, very correct point about uh, how it helped you be compliant but doesn't make you compliant um, later on because that's a very relevant point. Uh, Rebecca, you, you're offering another note of caution here. Uh, your, your point is basically we can't uh, necessarily unify everything because some data may not be amenable to um, uh, centralization in one form or another. C can you explain what you mean a little bit more for the audience? Absolutely. This is something a lot of organizations don't really address, but there are situations where specific types of data should not be centralized to meet legal requirements or because the risks are simply just too significant, especially when you're talking about risk-based uh, and cloud-based repositories. So some of the issues involved have to do with data protection regulations, but also just risk management, such as data minimization. That's one of the key considerations that are applicable here. Centralize only the data necessary to support the purposes and goals of the repository. Also, it's important to be prepared for data subject access and deletion requests. So data tagging is going to be important within those repositories. Of course, you need policies, procedures, and processes to be in place to support data accountability and to maintain data integrity and to meet legal requirements. And finally, just a few of the many legal requirements for such considerations include U.S. regulations such as HIPAA and FISMA and FedRAMP. We also have state laws such as CCPA. And then we also have what probably everybody out there um, is very familiar with by now, the EU GDPR. Brilliant. Thanks very much, too, Rebecca. Uh, finally, um, come on to yourself, Jason. Um, you're really talking about simplifying data. I think I think this is a complex topic, and I think everyone would welcome the opportunity to understand how one can simplify uh, the problem space a little bit. So please um, expound on that for everyone's benefit. Sure, sure. The, the first the first tip I'd have is that file and data management ought to be thought of as part of your overall security strategy. Like I mentioned, my 
my my original background is in the networking and network security space and what you wound it up starting to have is all of the various parts of network management and planning started to get centralized in the concept of security right because uh, I, I have this broad ecosystem there i have different systems i need them to talk to each other but if i don't have security weaved through that i'm going to run into issues i'm going to run into unexpected risks seeing the same thing happen from the data and management perspective historically you know file servers and, and data pools might have been managed by a more generic sae team what we're seeing today is that oftentimes the conversations we're having is with people from the offices of the C of the CISO. And this makes perfect sense because files and data coming into the ecosystem is a core way that threats get introduced. And of course, as was already touched on, exfiltration of sensitive data can pre pre present a number of challenges as well. So I think thinking about my file and data management strategy, not just from an an infrastructure perspective, but that this is a core part to my overall security posture. That mindset is really important for technology teams. Uh, the, the second point would be making it easy for your internal users to adopt the way that you want things done. Oftentimes, unsec unsanctioned mechanisms for sharing, accessing data, pulling stuff to your local machine, using other cloud services it happens because uh, internal it may not be providing solutions for employees to leverage for collaboration so having something that you actually sanction and approve and have governance controls around is a key way to prevent prevent that the third piece is actually understanding what you have right i, I still find it sometimes somewhat surprising when we're talking to customers and they don't actually realize what data they have in the different parts of their ecosystems. Like, oh, I didn't realize that was up in this AWS cloud pool. We should probably do something about that. So ensuring that you're actually classifying your content, uh, you're applying the right policies and rules so that you don't have to do so much cleanup later, but early in its life cycle, you already put the rules and regulations in place such that it can't get into places that it otherwise shouldn't be. These are some of the things that are important. Easier said than done, of course, especially in a, a an environment that's been there for some time. But if, if you can start to move towards this, this model and apply these principles, it, it can help solve a lot of challenges. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. And I, I'm glad you mentioned that it's not easy to do with um, um, legacy environments. And that's where one of the bigger challenges lies. And I think we'll come on to that uh, as we go through the conversation. So thanks very much for that, Jason. And I think it sets up the, sets up the afternoon's conversation really quite nicely, those tips. And I know we're going to go into them in more detail as we go along. I'm going to leave the, um, uh, the slide up with our headshots on it so you can understand uh, and remind you who we represent when we're talking today. Um, and I want to remind everyone today that this is an interactive conversation. Uh, our audience are very much part of the conversation, and we're looking forward to having your questions so that I can feed through to the panelists as we're going along. I'm pleased to see someone has already come up with a question, which is very much along the lines of what Jason's already talking about. And I'm sure we'll come on to that as we go into the conversation further on. Um, for my part, you know, since I've been dabbling with computers and involved with information security, the goals of having these unified data repositories has always been at the heart of a lot of the conversations we've been having. Uh, particularly if you go back to the early 90s, we were always talking about how we were going to build systems to unify and the whole concept of database management, relational databases, etc. was at the heart of everything we were trying to do. Uh, and to a large extent, it's been the holy grail. But I don't want to appear too negative because we know that some technologies are actually coming available to do it. And for the work I'm doing with my clients at the moment, I've certainly seen the way that, if you like, the big cloud infrastructure providers, the Googles, the Amazons, are actually looking at how they unify data for you as cloud infrastructure users in the sense of all the security information they generate. And that's a really uh, excellent example of how they've gone about trying to unify everything in one place where people can get access to it. Um, so this is really an important concept of how we're taking in, uh, databases and data repositories and unify them to allow a common data view, to allow coherent decision making across the organizations. Um, so this afternoon, what we want to try and do is explore this topic, provide you with some insights on how we can achieve this goal. 
Um, and we're going to try and look at some tips that will help you achieve ability to maintain security and integrity of the data. And also, clearly, as Rebecca was saying, meet regulatory drivers that are driving us in certain directions about what we can and cannot do. So let's start by looking at this problem from the from the outset and looking at some of the issues. Uh, Dirk, for, from the basics is that there is originally data, as we mentioned, exists in multiple systems in different um, contexts, in different various formats out there. What are some of the tips on how to deliver on the promise of data quality improvement when implementing a unified data repository? The, the the best one to start with is to to pick up with um, Jason covered uh, um, as his third point on on the slide, which is to to do discovery and classification. Um, I mean, you need to know your source. You need to to clean up. You need to reduce that um, redundant, obsolete, trivial data before you consolidate it. Um, and, and consolidating data into a unified repository um, doesn't sort of uh, relieve you from the need to do continuous discovery as that one is um, helping you, which I mentioned, uh, to prevent data sprawl, which is, in all fairness, it's a must for compliance. Yeah? Um, pay attention to ongoing management, validation, enrichment, mm. quality monitoring um, of that data that is now in the unified repository. You want to keep that um sort of as accurate as possible mm, and to to maintain or to keep it as accurate as possible the third tip is to uh look at data lineage and version control which is there to help you to ensure the relevancy and the quality of the data that's brilliant thank you for that i mean i i would actually really um stress the importance of the inventory that you mentioned you know i mean certainly looking at the payment card industry you know the importance of understanding where card data is through your systems is always been one of the major stress points for any organization i'm sure it's the same in healthcare data as well um, that rebecca will do it actually understanding your inventory and then classifying that inventory is going to be a critical step forward so thank you for that um, Dirk. Uh, we're now going to move on to our first poll and i'm pleased to see that many of you are already answering uh, the the quote poll question. Uh, this one is all about which of the uh, following most closely describes the biggest challenge for your organization for establishing and or maintaining a unified data repository. Um, hopefully by understanding your challenges that you respond to, we'll be able to knock some of them down during our conversation. So while you consider that uh, and provide your insights, um, let's look at another view of the scope and breadth of where data might lie. And it's not just about what data we have, it's also what systems they're in, isn't it, Rebecca? I mean, we've got lots of data out there in edge devices, in IoT devices, for example, mobile computing platforms, you know, even some of the um, 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 shadow IT that Dirk was mentioning earlier on, that's also included. So what are some of the use cases for when and how this data should be incorporated into a centralized data inventory and repository. Yes, well, that's so important to start planning whenever you're thinking about these edge type of devices, because each situation is going to depend upon the context within which those devices are used and the purposes and goals, right? So there are many different types of use cases from all industries and even within public life, because there's a lot of data, you're a walking data cloud when you're out there. So there's a lot of data coming off of you being collected by the digital devices you walk by. Now, for use cases, I'm going to focus on healthcare examples for now. So here are some healthcare use cases that are specific to transmitting medical data from wireless network connected insulin pumps. And this is a type of Internet of Medical Things or IOMT type of product putting into a centralized repository. So a lot of folks would think, well, we can do this, the centralization all the same because it's all for the insulin pumps, right? Well, not necessarily because you can be looking at a centralized repository for many different reasons for the data coming from the same device. So first of all, you need to identify the purpose for centralized repositories. So here are three different use cases just for a wireless insulin pump. So number one, you might need to get data to perform device diagnostics and analysis. So a few examples include using the associated data to determine how the device can be improved 
evaluating at how the data is currently stored, identifying security vulnerabilities within the insulin pump device itself and identifying privacy vulnerabilities of function. So that's just one purpose for collecting data. Another one might be to perform research for the insulin pump problems to the patients themselves and to successes with specific types of patient groups, such as those based on ages or those from specific geographies. And then just one more use case for this same insulin pump. It would be maybe for data to do research for insulin uh, types of, of um, uses, right? So determining the feasibility based upon the data involved and the capabilities of the insulin pump to extrapolate specific types of data fields. So that's what you need to start thinking about first. What are your goals for the data you're collecting and how is that going to be used? And after you identify the specific use case, the next step is identifying the specific data needed for that specific purpose, identify the sources of the data. We know it's the insulin pump, but which types of, of insulin pumps are you looking at, from where are they located, and so on. Then you need to identify the frequency for which the data should be included within the repositories to meet those purposes and goals, maybe continuously, maybe once a, an hour, once a day, once a week. Thinking of those three examples I gave you, you can imagine that the frequency might be different for each of those purposes, right? And then identify the transmission methods, which a lot of people only think about that part when they're creating these centralized repositories. But you need to start thinking about what types of wireless transmissions are you using. Are you using classic Bluetooth? Are you using um, Bluetooth low energy or BLE? Are you using something else? And what are the associated risks that are based upon the context of the factors involved for where the device is going to be used? Don't forget about the physical factors too. So then I'll quickly go down the rest of some of these issues that you need to think about. The safeguards necessary to protect the confidentiality, integrity, mm -hmm. and availability of the data. All three of those have to be considered. Determine the data backup methods, the frequency, the length of time to keep the specific types of data within the repository, not only for the purposes of your goals, but also to meet regulatory compliance. Then determine how to delete and remove that data from the centralized repository when it's no longer needed. And that's included in the backup. So these factors and considerations are necessary to best determine how to incorporate data into a centralized data repository using the chosen data repository tools. And those tools should have settings and options for these factors. If they don't, then you need to evaluate whether or not that's the best tool for you to use. Yeah, I mean, all those are absolutely outstanding points. Um, you know, I think the point you made right at the start of that, discussion about about the different use case scenarios is absolutely spot on you know that you really got to iron out the use case right right from the get-go before you actually start even doing this and what worries me though is that sometimes new use cases emerge once you've got that data and and then you may have to backtrack to determine what the regulatory implications of actually doing that particularly under gdpr uh, and healthcare industries when you're dealing with certain classes of data out there uh, the other thing I would also mention that you didn't mention is, you know, consideration of anonym anonymization of data when it's coming in. You know, that can often help because if you can anonymize it to uh, to avoid personal information um, in some form or other, that can also simplify your use case scenario management and your data management problems downstream. So that's an important class. Um, Re Rebecca, the results have come in from the poll. Um, I don't think we should be surprised, but 38% of the people have I said that identifying all the data sources and how to then incorporate data from the sources into their repository is the biggest challenge they place, which is really building on what Dirk said. Um, but do you see any um, oddities in those uh, or any strange things in those uh, results that you've uh, got in front of you? Actually, I'm not surprised about identifying because there's so many devices that come in and out of your uh, digital ecosystem, right? Especially with edge devices um, from third parties, from employees, from patients, 
depending on your where you're at. But I guess one thing that I'm kind of surprised at is understanding the compliance requirements. So kudos to all you um, attendees who, who understand that so well. I find that a lot of clients don't really uh, have all of their compliance requirements. So just a cautionary note there, I would say if you're, you're meeting compliance with only one regulatory um, regulation or law, make sure you know all the others that you have because there's a lot of specific requirements throughout all of the laws and regulations. Not only that, but also look at your website privacy notice. That is a legal requirement. And a lot of organizations don't meet those requirements with their actions. And then also uh, your contracts with B2B. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Steve, for that, uh, Rebecca. Really comprehensive answer. Um, so, so far, Dirk and Rebecca have both demonstrated that some of the associated systems and some of the challenges we were just talking about there uh, need to consider when building a strategy to unify uh, disparate data repositories. But they aren't the only issues we've got today. I mean, we've got two other things on the cloud and horizon to worry about, haven't we, Jason? You know, we've got public cloud and we've got AI to worry about in this space as well. So do they use, introduce any specific challenges for organizations when it comes to uh, data repository management? Yeah, so, certainly a good topic. Uh, I was just at a, a trade show in, in the Middle East, and the whole theme was about AI. And so you couldn't take two steps without folks talking about their AI solutions as vendors uh, and also leaders of, of organizations talking about how they're looking at leveraging it. So these things are real. It's not future in the horizon. These are challenges right now that are being faced. Um, on the front of, of public cloud, I think what Rebecca mentioned was, was really of note that being aware of what's okay to be in different locations is the starting point because there's some content, there's some data that shouldn't be in a repository that exists inside of your public cloud environment. But that's not always the case. There's still sometimes this uh, uh, this false belief that on-premises is always more secure and the better the option. And in some cases that is true, but there's other cases where it's okay. But the challenge is having the knowledge of what you actually have in that ecosystem and ensuring that you have the same policies that would apply for content and data on-premises uh, to that cloud ecosystem as well. So having a unified way to make sure the same rules of engagement are across your entire environment, regardless of where it is, is important. The other challenge that you have that, that connects into that is that oftentimes there may be a group within an enterprise that starts a small project, starting to leverage public cloud services before you know it, oh, uh, those services are actually being used for production use cases. And again, if the office of the CIO, the office of the CISO are not aware of that, well, that's when you start running into issues of lack of, of knowledge about where your data actually exists. So that's certainly a challenge that we see. The same with AI, right? Most uh, leaders of enterprise organizations uh, have AI on their list of priorities because they're looking to see how they can leverage it to be a bit more competitive within whatever industry that they're in. You know, of course, the, the, the driver to leveraging these different models is about feeding it with data, training it so that you can actually get useful knowledge from those systems. Well, just the same way as you'd have rules around which content can be shared with whom, uh, which content is available for uh, sharing outside of your environment, even internally, uh, there's rules of who can access different levels of content. Well, that same approach needs to be applied here. I need to have some level of control that prevents me from potentially having PII or other sensitive IP exposed to these models. I then have a, a further challenge. Once, once I'm now leveraging these models to generate answers to questions, well, who in the ecosystem actually has the right or uh, the ability to see those answers, right? If I derive, if I derive knowledge from content that user A doesn't have access to, well, are they entitled to actually see the results of that answer? And how do you how do you bifurcate that, right? So these are some of the complex challenges that customers are having to face now. As Rebecca also mentioned, all of the regulatory uh, requirements that are becoming much much more intense in Europe and U.S. Middle East really globally, 
this trend is only expected to uh, increase. So a focus on how you leverage these uh, different technologies and stacks for benefiting the organization while ensuring you're still maintaining compliance. And you're also just staying aligned with your own information security posture. Uh, these are some, some tough challenges that, that are being faced right now. Brilliant. Thank you for that, Jason. Um, it's interesting. Lots of things you mentioned about AI are things that we discussed in previous webinars on AI. So those are really spot on, if I may say so. And, and I, I'd also make one particular point to remind everyone. Um, years ago, when we were dealing with um, things like um, uh, data lakes and using business integration tools to integrate and get value out of that data, one of the things we noticed very quickly when one of the companies I was working with um, was that there were emergent risks and uh, compliance risks that arose from the business intelligence tools that you put on top of that data because you were actually seeing more things from that data than perhaps you should be seeing or even regulatory allowed to take action upon. Um, and, and I can see where I where AI tools may also generate emergent risks for um, companies, emergent compliance risks, which they may need to address and be considerate about. Uh, as well as the access permissions and all the things else goes on with AI as well. So those are really excellent points. So thank you for that. Uh, we're going on for a second poll of the day. Uh, and the second poll of the day is all about have your organization implemented a data lake or data warehouse? Um, and we'll come to the responses in a moment. Um, but while you consider that, um, I think we need to ask ourselves that um, – um, uh, all about how we do the streamlining business. I mean, I'm, I'm familiar with much of it, but some of the streamlining issues that are available uh, or the challenges do cause everyone uh, sort of mental problems. I mean, for example, some of the data is holding, say, like a, a customer CRM system versus marketing automation or collaboration tools. Um, and so therefore, Dirk, does, does this create its own access governance challenges when you've got the same data in different repositories, which you're then merging and gaining access to, to giving everyone access to? Um, well, it, it certainly doesn't relieve you from, from um, access governance challenges. I mean, if you, if you move things from, uh, from, from a CRM or a marketing automation tool, uh, if you copy that into a data repository, um, it still resides in that CRM. Um, what you can do is that you can reduce direct access to these uh, systems of engagements or systems of record. You can help uh, your access or you reduce your access governance challenges by giving only people who actually are involved in these sort of processes of uh, using the systems of engagement, systems of record, giving them access to these. And the other ones that are like me, I'm, I'm, I'm not in sales. Uh, if I'm, I don't have to use Salesforce. Uh, what I need is uh, sort of analytics and reporting. I can get that from, the, from, a, from a UDR. Um, so that is um, one of the elements. And in, in, in typical use cases are the sort of uh, the, the the need to share sh uh, spreadsheets, uh, PPTs, whatever, where there is exports from these systems. Forget about all about this. Now, if your UDR is there, you can use that for the analytics, uh, analytics and the reporting. Nevertheless, um, there is a need to implement consistent controls that are across all the systems. So your your engagement, your system of record, your UDR. So um, you can have access attestation, for example, roles management that are um, helping you to um, to maintain that governance of what kind of access is there. Um, and the final part is, if if you're as I said, you you still have to do it in in maybe a little bit of of a less of a headache because there's a unified thing you can use for that. You still have to do that in a, or best way to do it, uh, it's um, um, a better phrase, a way to phrase it, is to say, okay, consider just-in-time access for the most sensitive systems, for the most sensitive data, so that there is no constant um, sort of standing privilege to access data in that sense. Before we go on to look at the poll responses, um, 
-hmm. when you talk about these um, um, various tiers of access into this data, one of the uh, one of the questions for one of the audience is all about the issues and challenges of classifying data across different products, across different systems, and across different product formats, for example. I mean, do you see that as a challenge in the way of trying to manage access governance? Well, it, yes, it is a challenge. Um, it is a question of how do you uh, build up your data classification scheme? I mean, the, the, you can't go out there and say, okay, I have uh, only regulated data. You, you, you do have to consider the value of the data for your own businesses as well um, and bring up some sort of um, combined approach saying, okay, I have classified regulated data, I have sensitive data, I have data that is important for my business processes. Um, and then to say, um, once I have this sort of idea of how do I label the data in place, I can go in to use um, tools, data classification tools to use these labels and um, formulate the identification for that so that you, you have your patterns, social security numbers is sort of the simplistic example, account numbers, credit card numbers is another simplistic example. Um, the, the idea behind is to say um, classification in itself, just buying a tool and let it run won't solve the issue. Um, you need to be um, sort of uh, prepared for using the tool by saying, okay, I want it to classify the data according to my needs. There might be regulated needs or regulator, regulatory needs, sorry for that, um, but there are also needs that are sort of, uh, that origi originate in, in your business, in your business processes. Um, so coming back to the question is sort of, tools do, do help you, um, and there are a couple of tools that are like the question post uh, related to, okay, you know, I can classify PDFs, I can classify things that are in the database or something like that. Um, there are more generic tools as well that help you to sort of be broader in the scope. But once you're there, uh, once you have your classification scheme, once you have your idea of how do I, um, label my data and have the tool in place, you should be there. You should be able to say, okay, now that I have these labels in place, I can um, use them to maintain my access governance. Yeah, yeah. I went back into some of the strategies that introduced me to information security years ago, which was labeling and mandatory access permissions in one form or another in old technology in the 80s and 90s. But yeah, I do understand where you're coming from. Um, and that data classification well, is important. Need to know and right to know are very old concepts. Yeah, Absolutely right. Absolutely. And they don't go away. They don't go away. Um, no. The results are in. Do, do the results surprise you at all? I'm, I'm very encouraged that 43% of people are actually um, uh, using or implementing data lakes or data warehouses. Well, that's um, kind of surprising. I haven't expected this to be uh, that high. I mean, the, the the second part is sort of in deployment or planning in deployment. I, I hope that the sort of topics we discuss do help you for the, at least for the planning part. Um, kind of surprised I am about the not sure answer being at 13% because that means that uh, the, the, the people answering, I'm not sure, they are kind of not involved into uh, what's going on in, in the business. Sorry to say it in, in that sort of German direct way. Um, better ask yourself why you are not sure and make sure that you get the uh, sort of the certainty that whether there is one or not, because um, as simple as that, if, if, if you handle data and it's regulated, you might have some difficulties. Yes, absolutely right. Absolutely right. Well, thank you for that, Doug. That's very kind of you. Um, well, one of the important things in, in this uh, whole area of consolidating data repository is it starts to help to protect data if it's all in one place. You know, indeed, 
that was a strategy that we used to champion when I was at Visa Europe in relation to credit card data. The idea was having um, the cardholder data environment as small as possible and as consolidated as possible so you could actually protect that in a robust uh, way. Uh, but it's not the only regulatory requirement that we have out there for doing it. So many regulations are driving us in that direction, aren't they, Rebecca? Um, data minimization, data minimization uh, requirements are proliferating with increasing uh, of course, all regulations, including GDPR, um, HIPAA, etc. So, what types of data should should not be included? So, let's look at the negative. What data shouldn't be included in those centralized data repositories to support such data minimization requirements? Well, I'm going to go back to that data minimization concept that I mentioned earlier because it's becoming more and more important as we are collecting and deriving more and more data. So data that's included within centralized repositories should include only the minimum necessary data to support the goals and purposes for which the repository was established to begin with. I see too many organizations just creating repositories and they start dumping more and more data in there. And it's like, you know, oh, well, we might need this sometime. Oh, we can use this to train AI. Ah, watch out for that. That's another topic. I want to focus back onto this because that, that's just dangerous. So data minimization. So this means do not collect any more personal data than is justified by the purposes which should be documented that were communicated to the individuals from whom that personal data was originally collected or derived. And I, when I say derived, I'm talking about that data, such as in the insulin pumps I talked about before. That data is derived. The insulin pump is creating data, right? Um, if the centralized data repository is being used for AI tools and training the AI algorithms, then don't include personal data within such repositories unless, unless you have obtained consent for any personal data and have verified with the appropriate legal counsel who has expertise in AI and data protection laws that personal data in addition to intellectual property, that's something else, else I'm seeing is getting dumped into huge repositories um, that shouldn't be. This can be data that's trademarked or copyrighted or otherwise legally protected against unauthorized use. Make sure that they're not being put into such repositories unless you've checked and you've confirmed that this is appropriate, legal, and so on. This is a huge yeah. issue. It's a hot topic being discussed and debated right now throughout many online conversations. And you know what I, I recommend organizations to do do a risk assessment to be performed specific to the data repository collection plans to identify the risks and associated issues with the types of data that's planned to be collected to ensure those plans support compliance as well as to identify where such plans need to be reworked. A lot of organizations, when they think about risk assessments, they think of whole system risk assessments, right? But risk assessments are a great tool. You can narrow the scope to just one type of application. Yeah. And when you do that, do it to your plan before you've already implemented something new. If you do a risk assessment on your plan, you can identify a lot of problems before you start coding and implementing. So do that. And then you can find out if this plan shows that we're going to be violating laws, legal, legal requirements, and applicable contractual requirements. I keep bringing that up because in a lot of the expert witness cases I've supported, it was due to violating contractual requirements. But anyway, look, make sure that um, you are following all legal requirements for all those different types of legal aspects. Brilliant. Thank you for that, Rebecca. I, I make two observations. One is you mentioned about data lake. I think that's an unfortunate uh, 
sort of description because it has the impression you're just dumping something in it and it's unstructured and everything else. So I think the sooner we move away from the term data lake, the better. The, the second is this whole, you, which you stress, which I stressed earlier, I can't go, I must go back to it. This idea that when you put this data together, you get emergent use cases coming up and it's those use cases that generate this risk and you've got to be on top of those all the time. And, and actually sometimes actually beat them down and say you can't do this for good re legal and compliance reasons. I think it's a really important consideration for everyone. We're going off for our third and final poll of the day. Uh, this one is all about uh, your organization's biggest challenge in balancing data security and ease of collaboration on the other side. Um, and while you're responding to that, I, I think it's beneficial to get some more feedback from our panel um, because they're actually out there supporting other audiences and other clients out there with trying to implement this solution. Um, so let me turn to yourself, Jason. Um, how are your customers uh, addressing the problems of maintaining compliance, governance and security while enabling much needed collaboration and access to data across the organization and enterprise? Yeah, great question. Uh, as, as noted in, in the intro, this is really a key part of our of our focus. Right? We work with a lot of government agencies, a lot of enterprise customers, and they may have somewhat sensitive content, but in some cases there is valid reason for collaborating on that. Let's say two different government agencies. Of course, there's a number of rules and regulations that have to be applied there, but there may be some valid reasons for, for, for collaborating on the same piece of content no different with enterprises who have a variety of partners that they're engaging with as well. So getting that right balance of securing the data you have, securing the content you have, while still providing mechanisms for collaboration when it's justified uh, is, is a key challenge. What we're seeing customers do, uh, partly fueled by the current compliance landscape uh, that Rebecca noted is taking it more seriously and looking mm. at how you can bring in tools and solutions that help you to unify those things and get the right controls. With many different solutions, if I provide you access to content outside of my organization, I don't have control over your account. I don't have control over the entity that I sent the content to. If that was an email, if it was a generic sharing solution that provides that type of access, I lose the track record of what you're actually doing with that content. So we're certainly seeing a, a higher demand of customers looking for offerings that prevents that, where, where you continue to maintain control over the entity that you shared the content with, even if that entity exists outside of your organization. Also, we're seeing definitely a, a, a trend of of working with experts, right? So bringing in uh, service providers, bringing in consultants where their focus is understanding this landscape, right? Rebecca mentioned earlier, it's important if you're you're focusing on one uh, specific track that you need to be at least aware of the adjacent tracks because there's oftentimes overlap, there's oftentimes interactions. Uh, the folks oftentimes responsible for data and the strategy may not be experts in this space, there, there's some knowledge, there's some awareness, but they're not necessarily experts. So we're certainly seeing an increase in this space as well, of bringing in uh, experts such as Rebecca and others that can help and provide uh, some augmentation to the existing team uh, that's there. So getting the right knowledge in the organization uh, from those experts, as well as looking at specific tools and solutions that give you greater control and, and allow you to balance collaboration uh, with, with privacy. Those are some of the key things we're seeing our customers focus on these days. Brilliant, thank you very much, Jason. I mean, the results are in um, uh, to, the, to the poll, um, which is uh, which are interesting um, insofar as it's not surprising that uh, ensuring that sensitive data is classified appropriately as relevant policies apply against it gets 31%. Uh, and 33% uh, um, make maintaining data governance. Um, do those sort of, um, can, does that sort of gel with what you're experiencing from your own clients and customers? Yes, it, it does track maintaining data governance as, as being the lead there, even with the, the scenarios that we mentioned, and also the thread that's been through our discussion of classifying and knowing what type of content you actually have in the first place. Is it okay for this to be 
uh, leveraged in different ways. Uh, certainly those would, would track, I'd say maybe the slight surprise is meeting compliance requirements. I would have expected that perhaps to be a bit higher, to be number one or number two, given how loudly we're hearing our customers talk about that as yeah. one of their challenges. That may be uh, a small bit of surprise in the in the poll results there. Yeah, that that's also meets uh, the sort of concern that Dirk was expressing and Rebecca was expressing as well in response to their polls as well. So I think we've got a common theme there. Never mind. Moving on. Thank you for that, uh, Jason. Uh, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the major benefits in the areas of uh, centralized data aggregation is in the industry is in the area of security management. And I mentioned the issue of big cloud providers, and we have seam tools out there doing the same sort of thing uh, out there. Um, Dirt, from your from your perspective, where you work in Netrix, um, can the implementation of unified data storage help us reduce the amount of monitoring and logs we need to collect, focusing on uh, the centralized data location? Mm, uh, no, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, keep in mind, this. It is important, really important, to remember that. Unified data repositories can only or do only keep copies. I mean, you, you systems of record, um, you don't sort of take the data out of them um, because they are systems of record. Um, so having the copies of the data from other systems on the UDR um, mm -hmm. still requires you to, to, to demonstrate that you have visibility into changes and in access um, to all these data and systems that uh, puts you out of potentially puts you out of compliance. I mean, um, if you can't maintain your records, um, that gives get, gets you into legal problems. If um, a, a unified repository does help you to reduce the number of people with access, so you can sort of expect less noise, but there are still uh, there's still the need to collect the logs. There's still the need to to uh, to monitor what's going on, um, and therefore, let's say the using a consistent approach to to all the systems um, or across all the systems that tells you who has access to what, that has um, is telling you. Um, how the, the the access settings are changing, how users are using this access, that is helping you. Um, but unfortunately, it 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 it's still it this the need is still there to 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 get the logs, to collect the logs, to to analyze the logs. Um, maybe on a on a different way of doing it, maybe with less noise, um, maybe with less false positives. But it's still there to to be analysed and monitored. And can I thank you for reminding everyone and ourselves that there is always going to be a system of record behind the unified data repository feeding that information in there that we need to protect. I think that is a really important point. And thanks for expressing that, Dirk. That was really, really uh, very useful for me as well as I'm sure for the rest of the audience. Um, thank you for that answer. Um, uh, earlier, we heard about there's some data management scenarios where it's not recommended to centralize the aggregation of data. And I think we would certainly be ill serving our audience, Rebecca, if we didn't explore this in more detail. So can you give us some more use cases uh, where the use of centralized unified data repositories shouldn't be used um, because they would create risks, et cetera, for organizations? I love this question because I see so much risk, unnecessary risk and non-compliance risk occurring because of the way in which just humongous data repositories are being created from collecting all the data possible. And then they're being taken out to um, large cloud servers and the processing is going on there when if it was engineered differently, it could be so much more secure and also give you what you need. So currently, there are many efforts to collect a huge amount of personal data, much of it's sensitive data and highly privacy invasive data to take basically any type of point in time activity actions. And I think this is a key aspect of it. 
think about the point in time activity action. So widely applicable use cases include such things as for age verification, for facial recognition, for access, authentication, and so on. These are point in time uses, right? And for these types of use cases where they are only being performed to validate some time of situation, some type of verification of authenticity and so on, instead of collecting all that data and putting it in a centralized location and processing it there, and then storing all that data that was used for verification in addition to the processing results there, instead push that processing to the edge devices and send the results to the central repository. Since obtaining the results were the goal for doing that one-time processing activity to begin with, right? So if you want to do age verification, it, it from a systems engineer perspective, you can push that processing to most edge devices now, at least the ones that are supported. Uh, have operating systems that are supported, do the processing there and use the data that's on that edge device and then send the results to the central repository. That way you don't have that sensitive data yeah. stored centrally. Yeah, and actually the idea of doing edge processing is really at the heart of actually many payment processing systems. I'm very familiar with that. In fact, the chip and pin card is actually an element of edge processing um, that is really vital and does a lot of the hard number trenching for everyone out there. So thanks for that. Um, uh, well, let's look at where the future is going. Um, Jason, you're one of the primary technologists here. You're dealing with your your company seems to be fitting uh, the place for there. So let's uh, give everyone your thoughts on what are the key trends in the enterprise around centralized data management out there. Sure. One of the points actually was what was just noted around, around edge computing, P pushing the processing closer to where uh, the actual source of the, the the data is for all the reasons that were were noted. I think one one of the other ones, however, would be real time data integration. Right? It's it's oftentimes said that for the majority of organizations, data is ultimately their IP, and so this is another factor that comes in. Most organizations are looking at how they can leverage the data that they do have. Even some of it might be sensitive for driving their business forward, right? Knowing more about their customers, of course, in a sanctioned, regulated way, uh, being able to look at the interactions that their customers are having with their solutions, any range of, of, of data points, turning that into insights. And this is why we're seeing uh, the progressions of solutions like iPaaS, right? Where I, I have all these different data sources, I'm doing some sort of processing, bringing things together, I'm now generating some insights and then also potentially allowing that data to be available just in time for other systems to consume. So this is one of the primary things that we also see coming into this is that customers are looking to see how they can leverage their data to help their businesses move forward. But get, again, of course, they have to do that in a compliant, governed, safe, privacy conscious way. And so finding, again, that balance is a key focus of, uh, of leaders within, within enterprise IT. We talked, of course, about AI. That can't be overstated, how this is mm -hmm. right up there and high in the list of, mm -hmm. of leaders and enterprise organizations as well. And, and again, it, it, you can't ignore it. It's too big to ignore and organizations will be left behind. Um, you know, yes, there are malicious ways that it can be leveraged. There are there are dangers. There's dangers to driving a car, right? But you still drive. So it, it's kind of similar. And this is a trend that's going to take hold. So us as vendors, as well as leaders in enterprise organizations and government figuring out how to do this in a safe way is also very important and one of the one of the core trends that that I would say we're seeing when it comes to centralizing data, leveraging it for intelligence, but ensuring that you're doing that in a in a compliant way. 
Brilliant. Thank you for that, uh, Jason. Um, very uh, positive forward. Now, we've got time, uh, a little bit of time, um, to go through some of the audience questions here. And I've picked out three that I think uh, are sufficiently different and useful for us um, to go through. I'm going to start with yourself, Dirk. Um, there's a very good question here about from uh, Indra about um, the issue of um, scale and growth. I mean, with these data repositories, they're going to grow quickly. Databases need to grow quickly, very, very quickly to respond to the amount of data put in them. Uh, do you and your experience in Netflix give you any insights to um, challenges in this space? Mm. Um, well, the, 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 if, if you want to stay on, on top of um, the, the, the growth of data, um, the, the one thing you, you can do is um, do a continuous classification. I mean, um, if you have already started doing classification, if you have already put out your data classification scheme, nothing is stopping you from doing that continuously so that you don't create a gap, you don't create a backlog. Um, that would be probably the best answer to that. If um, if you if you fear that uh, exponential growth of data using um, data analytics, um, AI, uh, large language models, whatever, to uh, even provide you more um, data based upon the data, make sure you always um, do that uh, continuous classification. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Steve, for that, Dirk. Um, Rebecca, there's a really interesting one here that um, has come forward. It may be not your area of expertise, but I'm sure it may across the privacy professor's ground somewhere. But the issue question of unified data repositories in respect of legal and mergers and acquisition type industries. I mean, they must be some particularly unique challenges for them about consolidating data in one repo. This is a great question because mergers and acquisitions, in, in addition to divestitures, which has similar but yet different risks involved, oh my gosh, you have to do a lot of planning when you are doing mergers and acquisitions. Too many organizations I've seen, and even one that I um, supported many years ago because these problems have persisted for decades, Basically, you can't just connect everybody's data together when you acquire another organization and just say, OK, we'll just share the data and things will be fine. No, you have to do a lot of pre-planning to identify what do you have in the data? What are your current promises, your legal requirements, your obligations that you've made for the data within each of those repositories? And then you have to do a gap analysis and a risk assessment between what your organization has promised and the governance and the rules by which you're following for the management of that data in your organization and the organization you've required and see what they're doing. And you have to see where there's conflicts. You have to see where there might be challenges if you do want to combine them because you can't always combine the databases of an organization you acquire with your organizations, even though that sounds like it should be possible to, it makes it simpler for management, right? No, you, you have to do an analysis first to find out what are the requirements currently being followed for each, just even down to simple things like the definition of personal data. This is something that, Different organizations have defined the types of data items that are considered to be personal data in different ways. So all of a sudden, if you acquire an organization who has defined different types of data items as personal information that you don't have in that definition, how is that yeah. going to impact your organization? Are you going yeah. to update um, your organization's definition to meet your acquired organization or now are they going to have to change theirs? So you have to go through and actually look at every aspect of that, the databases first before you only stick to what's oftentimes the only thing done is just looking at the technical aspects. Yeah. You have to look at the administrative aspects and even the physical aspects too of how that data is accessed and the physical um, 
risks that are involved, such as through, you know, public kiosk or whatever, because those have asked, um, those Thank have implications. Thanks for that, Rebecca. And I just want to do bring Jason in finally before we go to the takeaways. This is a relatively short, hopefully a short answer, Jason. If you can make it short, I'd appreciate it. Someone's asked a question about the environmental impact of these data centers that we're trying to create. And that comes home to me because I've just done 27,001 audit for one of my clients and environmental implications are now part of 27,001 uh, as well. So are there environmental implications for some of these big data centers? Sure, and, and I will keep it keep it brief. The, the same concepts we talked about really are important here. If you think about uh, ESG, you think about organizations, let's say that are subject to CSRD in Europe. Well, those organizations are getting audited actually on their environmental and sustainability uh, uh, practices, right? So having strong governance over the data that's gonna be involved are really important or that can have real implications monetarily on the organization. So really, uh, if an organization falls under these types of requirements, you really should be connecting your data management strategy to your ESG goals as well. Brilliant. Thank you very much Steve, for that, Jason. I'm perfectly on time as well, sir. Thank you very much, Steve. And uh, something I can take on board with my own ISO 27,000 or certification of the clients. Uh, and thank you for all my panelists. It's been a really stimulating conversation this afternoon. I'm over appreciate it very much indeed. Uh, we're now going to give the opportunity for our panelists to give us their final takeaways. And we're going to start with yourself, Jason. So if you'd like to um, give us your takeaway of this evening, I'd appreciate it. Sure. As, as we talked about throughout the discussion, FileCloud, our, our core solution, is all centered on helping customers balance uh, keeping control, governance, and security of their sensitive company data, while also balancing that with the need for collaboration. So we invite any who are interested to uh, visit the website, FileCloud.com. Uh, you can find out some more information from the content there, try a trial, uh, and feel, feel free to reach out. Thank you very much, Dave Jason. Uh, Rebecca, your takeaway of this evening. Well, ultimately, you need to make decisions for centralized repositories taking into consideration where the central repository is located online in a cloud server behind a firewall with limited data access and so on. I'm going to hit that data minimization again because it's emerging. You need to be aware of that. Also, you need to do as much processing at the edge as possible and only collect that which is absolutely um, required. You can follow my mm -hmm. Privacy and Security Brainiacs page on LinkedIn and visit privacysecuritybrainiacs.com for more guidance and tips on uh, all these types of issues. We love working with MSPs, consultancies, and law firms to uh, help provide their clients with these types of items as well. Thank you very much, Steve, Rebecca. A pleasure meeting you again this evening. And Dirk, over to you for your takeaway for this evening. Well, how to put it together? I mean, um, those who attended today have just made the first step to learn about the, the unified data repository. So learn about the technology. Um, assess the needs of your organizations in terms of regulatory compliance, in terms of data classification, um, how that influences decision-making processes. Um, you want to consider the costs and benefits of UDRs, um, talking about ESG as one element of it, um, and yeah, take it from there. Don't stop learning about it. We are not stop learning about it, Dirk. And it, this is one of the webinars that helps everyone achieve that. And thank you for all my panelists for the contribution. It's been a really good conversation this afternoon. And thank you to the audience for their questions as well. Uh, Kelly, over to you to close us out. All right. Thank you, Colin. And thank you again to the panelists for a great discussion. I know our audience appreciates the information. And listeners, for those of you who qualify for CPE credit, your certificate will be issued within seven days from our learning management system at itcpeacademy.org. So please watch out for the email notification on that and be sure to check your spam if you don't see that come through. So join us again early next month for a strategic approach to meeting PCI requirements in a cloud-driven world. You can reserve your seat now through the console, but before you do that, please do take a moment to leave us a rating and feedback for today's session. We value feedback, and it helps us to plan for future events. 
So that's it for today. I'd like to thank our speakers for your participation with a special thanks to our sponsors without whom this event would not be possible. And of course, thank you once again for listening. Please stay tuned for upcoming programs and we'll see you next time.